How many of you have ever been discouraged? Show of hands, yes? Can we? Anybody say, not me ever? You are a space alien then. Uh, we've all experienced that. And do you have certain things that you do or, or maybe things that, that help you feel better? Like I have a good friend, um, we don't do this very often, but he lives uh, in the Chicagoland area. He's also in, in full-time ministry. And every now and then, maybe a half dozen times in the last 10 years or so, when, when he's feeling discouraged, he'll call me up and just, or he'll text me and say, Buffalo Wild Wings, BWs. He just wants to go there and eat a whole bunch of boneless spicy wings. And that makes him feel better, I think, both spiritually and not so much physically later, but, you know, anyway, you get the idea. Perhaps you have things you like to do. You know, my wife likes to work outside in the yard when she's discouraged, and that makes her feel better. That actually discourages me to work in the yard, so it doesn't work that way for me. But what do you do when it's deeper than just circumstances? What do you do when you feel spiritually discouraged, wondering if God's there? You don't feel full of his presence and praise. You ever been in that place? What do you do about that? Many years ago when I was on a missions trip in Ecuador with our students in, in a different part of, we still go to that country with students, but this is a different part of the country at the time. Uh, we were in this little tiny remote village and we were doing vacation Bible school type programs with the kids every day for about four straight days. And, just, and, and droves of kids were coming. It just it felt like a great, fruitful time of ministry. We were sharing the gospel and, through interpreters and with them, loving on them physically and just playing with them and encouraging them. And, and then one of the students in the group said, well, why don't we do anything for the parents in this little poor village? Well, that's a good idea. We prayed about it as a group. A couple of the students put together a plan. And over the next day or so, we concocted a, a, a plan to bless them with some music and drama and a gospel message. And we did it in their little tiny village square in the center of their town. We prayed about this. We were excited about this. And we lugged all of our equipment on a Sunday afternoon after church out into the into the uh, village square there, and we put on this performance. We sung songs of praise, there was a drama, the, the whole thing. And you know what? By about a quarter of the way through it, 15 minutes in or so, it dawned on me, nobody cares. We had some food to hand out. People came over, got their snacks, and just walked on by. Nobody stopped, nobody sat down, nobody observed, you know. Nobody seemed to give, you know, two cents for what we were doing. We walked back, it was a total, radically different experience than being with the kids. We walked back to where we were staying, and that night we talked about that, and the, the students were extremely discouraged. We prayed about this. We planned this. Why didn't God show up? Why didn't anybody respond? It was not an easy question to answer. What do you do when you feel like you poured your heart out for God, or on behalf of God, or in service to God, and not much comes of it? Or more importantly, what does God have to say to us when we feel that way? In our series, our study through the book of Acts, we're in the last section of, this, of the story of Acts, which is really our story as well, shipwrecks, riots, and prison, the adventure of reaching. It's these crazy uh, interconnected stories that make up the sort of the end of the book of Acts, which is really the beginning still of the church and of our story today. Um, and all along, in the last couple of weeks, we've been tracking with the Apostle Paul, and we've been see, saying, um, seeing how he's been saying how important it is for him to get to Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 21, verses 13 and 14, he says this very thing when he's telling the apostles there, the disciples there, that he, he's, he's bound and determined to go to Jerusalem. Acts 21, and we'll have it on the screen there, verses 13 and 14. Then Paul answered, what are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, let the will of the Lord be done. The Jews, friends of Paul's, were warning him. Christian believers that were Jewish converts, Christian believers that were traveling with him were warning him. Prophets were warning him. Many people warned him, if you go to Jerusalem, it's going to go bad for you. And Paul says, essentially, I know this. I know this, but I'm bound and determined to go anyway. And when he finally gets there and preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ in that great city, and I can't help think, Pastor Brian and I were there just two months ago in that the holy city in, in Jerusalem, and it's still a very uh, religiously charged place with Christians, Muslims, and Jews living side by side. History lives in that city. When, when Paul gets there, and he's, he's been praying about it. He's been uh, feeling God's spirit move him. He's overcome a great deal. Now, he knows he's going to Rome. He was in Ephesus. It's not exactly on the way, if you know your geography, to go back to Jerusalem. It'd be faster just to go straight to Rome. So he, he feels this is what God wants for him. And when he finally gets there, 
and he finally preaches the gospel, the results are less than overwhelming. Pastor Brian will talk more about this next week. In Acts 21, he meets with the church, and the Christians in Jerusalem aren't exactly, they're not rude to him, but they're not exactly throwing him a party either. In fact, in Jerusalem, the Christian believers had learned to coexist with Jews that were converts who still struggled with obedience to the Old Testament law. And so they sort of just accepted that, don't make waves. And if you read the text, they seem more concerned with Paul not making trouble for them than excited that the great apostles there. And then Paul's uh, reception among the Jews, his own uh, people of heritage, is even worse, significantly worse. In Acts 22, Paul's preaching to a crowd of Jews in the temple that had earlier tried to kill him. And they actually listened to him up until the point he told them that God had told him to go to the Gentiles. So he's in the temple preaching the gospel. The Jews are angry with him. They try to kill him. And while he's being taken out of there by Roman guards, he stops and says, let me just give them one, let me talk to them one more time. And he preaches again. And he gives his testimony. Pastor Brian will go into that in detail. And at the end of that, they try to, they, 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 they're so incensed, they try to pull him apart even there. The crowd erupts, they're wild shouting, they're basically saying, Paul can't be allowed to live. Not what you'd hope for, right? All your prayers and longing to go to Jerusalem and preach the word. And they would have succeeded had Paul not been arrested by Roman authorities. And Paul has to invoke his own citizenship there to avoid being pulled apart, being scourged, and we'll get into that next week. In order to get to the bottom of all this, then, the Roman um, centurion who arrests Paul invites the Jews back the next day and says, I want to hear from you, and puts Paul in front of them. So twice now Paul's preached to them, and twice now they've tried to kill him, and twice he's been saved by the Roman authorities. A third time, if you're Paul, you're thinking, don't invite those guys. They, we're not getting along very well, right? He invites them back, puts Paul in front of them, and that's where we pick up the story in Acts 22, verse 30. We'll read through the, the first 10 verses of chapter 23 as well. You can turn there with me or follow on the screens. But on the next day, desiring to know the real reason why he was being accused by the Jews, he unbound him and commanded the chief priests and all the council to meet, and he brought Paul down and set him before them. That's, this is him is the Roman authorities, right? He brings Paul out, brings him back, and let's get to the bottom of this. Verse 1 of 23. And looking intently at the council, Paul said, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law? And yet contrary to the law, you order me to be struck? Those who stood by said, would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Now when Paul perceived that one part, one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. Then a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up and contended sharply, We find nothing wrong with this man. What if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? And when the dissension became violent, the, tri the tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him back into the barracks. Now, there's a lot going on here. Let me try to explain and give you a little context. First, you'll see an image here of the Temple Mount. This is actually a huge scale model. If you've ever been to Jerusalem, you know in the Jerusalem Museum, there's this massive model. You can walk around it of the Temple Mount. The mount is the platform. The temple is right in the center there, the large structure, not, not the one circled, the one in the center of that rectangular platform. That's the temple, which of course has been destroyed. That's where the Dome of the Rock is today. But that, in the red circle, that's what's called the Anto Antonia Fortress. That's where Pilate had his headquarters in Jerusalem. That's the barracks referred to in the text. So, just to give you the picture, Paul shows up in Jerusalem, meets with the leaders of the church, the Christians, goes to the temple and preaches in those courts. And the Jews are angry and want to kill him. Right next door is where the garrison of the Roman authorities are. They hear a ruckus, they come and basically rescue Paul. They think he's a troublemaker, are about to scourge him, right? He invokes his citizenship, which scares them into letting him, you know, not hurting him. 
And Paul says, let me one more time address them, which he does. They want to kill him again. So they put him in jail overnight. The next day, the Roman authority says, let's get to the bottom of this. Bring back the Jewish leaders. Let's get this guy out here. Let's settle it once and for all, right? So twice he preaches. Twice they want to kill him. The third time, Paul gets two sentences in, and what happens? You'll see the next picture is of the fortress itself. On those steps, most likely, is where he preached that second time. And again, this is a model. Because that fortress, is all, all you can see are the foundation stones today. What happens? Two sentences in, and the high priest tells one of the other members of the council, smack him on the mouth. It's, it's, it's astounding, right? Hey, whack that guy. Shut him up, right? Maybe a backhand. Smacks Paul on the mouth. Not exactly what you'd hope for in a reception. I've never been smacked on the mouth by someone I was preaching to. I hope that doesn't happen. I don't know how I'll respond. Paul says, God's going to smack you, you whitewashed wall, right? Not realizing who he's talking to. And then Paul realizes, I think, in the text, this is going nowhere. And in order to sort of get himself out of it, he, he, he mentions this resurrection of the dead between Pharisees and Sadducees. He knew, being raised as a Pharisee, that those guys vehemently disagree over this issue. So he is almost stirs them up in order to just sort of take the focus off of him for a moment, but it turns violent again in order to save his life. The Roman soldier arrests him again, puts him back in, a, in the barracks in a prison cell. It's really, if you think about that, think about Paul again, traveling all over the Roman world, preaching the gospel, establishing churches, seeing hundreds of people come to Christ, seeing miraculous things happen in the name of Jesus. Paul was a determined guy. We can say that at least, right? I think, you know, after the second time, probably after the first time, I'm like, this was a bad idea. I clearly had God's will wrong. I shouldn't have come. After the second time, I think almost even the boldest of us would be like, okay, obviously I had this wrong. Paul's a determined guy. But we know that, um, we know that prison and, per, and, pros, and persecution, excuse me, didn't surprise or dissuade Paul. I don't think the trouble in Paul's heart was because he was arrested. I don't think what troubled Paul was the fear of being physically beaten. That had happened to him before. In 2 Timothy, he gives a list of how many times he'd been beaten with rods and shipwrecked and arrested. And in 2 Corinthians, he talks about this is to be expected. It's part of the deal. In fact, if we go back in Acts, to Acts chapter 6, when Stephen gives his speech and they, they, they want to stone him to death, and at, at the end of that story, we, we, we hear that Saul of Tarsus is there giving approval to his death. You know who that is, right? He becomes the Apostle Paul. I think Paul, that stayed with Paul all his life. He knew he'd been forgiven for that by Christ, but he never got over that image, right, of the suffering of those for Christ. And I think he's saying, in a sense, count me with them. I'm not afraid to suffer with them. And he knew from the warnings of others and in his own spirit that if he went to Jerusalem, there would be physical pain, imprisonment, and difficulty. So I don't think it was prison or the threat of torture that discouraged him. I do think he was discouraged. I think it was the fact there didn't seem to be any results. Not one time in chapters 21 through 23 do we read of anyone believing in Jesus because of his preaching. Not one convert. Not one person repenting. Not one person going, I never saw it this way before. Nothing. Just anger, violence, and threats. I think Paul was perfectly willing to endure prison and hardship for the sake of the gospel, but when he saw the only response was rejection and violence, I think that was more painful to him than any prison cell. In Romans chapter 9, the Apostle Paul says, I could wish that I were cut off for the sake of my own people, the Jews. Even though he was called to go to the Roman world and build the church all over the Roman world, he had this heart for his own people, and he wants to come back and preach the gospel to them, for them to know the love of Jesus. And when he does that, they hate him for it. You know, even in Athens and in, in Lystra and in Corinth and Ephesus, he was in trouble at times. He was under threat at times. And some people rejected him, but there were always some who were converted, some who responded. Here in Jerusalem, of all places, his former home base, there's nothing, no response. How do we know Paul was discouraged? Let's look at verse 11, which is really the primary verse I want you to focus on for the rest 
of the sermon here. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. That is a fascinating verse. I've been meditating on that for the last several days. The text does not specifically say this, but here in verse 11, Jesus shows up to encourage him, to speak words of encouragement to him. Why else would he do this if Paul was not discouraged? Jesus is not one to waste words. Why does he show up and say, take courage, if Paul is full of courage? I think the fact that the text says that Jesus came and stood by him is very significant. Notice it doesn't say Paul felt the Lord's presence or the Lord said. It says the Lord came and stood by him. What does that mean? Does that mean that uh, Paul just sensed a presence? Have you, ever, have, you ever, have you ever felt the presence of God spiritually or have you just sensed that he was near? I have. Maybe it was, was that what it means? Or does it mean there was some actual tangible sense, physical sense of his presence? Was he in the prison cell, actually physically? He met Paul on the Damascus Road. Well, we don't know for sure, but remember, Luke is writing Acts, and Luke is recounting what Paul said to him. So when Luke says the Lord came and stood by him, I think we have to assume Paul put it that way. He came into my prison cell. He was there with me, right? Luke is recording what he's heard for us. And I think that's not insignificant. Whatever the case The point for us is that Paul knew for certain that God was with him. He knew without doubt that the presence of the Lord was near him. This is the encouragement of his presence. And I think it's the primary thing every one of us needs when we're discouraged. The first thing we need before words before change of circumstances, before answers to our problems, before some solution, is to know that God is near. Wouldn't you agree with that? When you're at your lowest point, you might not always think about it. You're thinking about how can I fix this and how can I get out of this and what's going to happen to me? But what we most need is to know that God is near. And I think it's very important the text says the Lord came and stood by him. You know, he sailed on a ship from Miletus near Ephesus to to Rome and landed in in Tyre and Sidon and got to, excuse me, got to Jerusalem, not Rome, and none of his friends are recorded in this story. They're not with him. Where were they? Probably after the first threat of death, you know, Paul, you're on your own now. But Jesus comes and stands by him. I imagine, I'm only imagining here, Paul in his cell that night in the fortress of Antonia, Right? replaying the events of the past several days in his mind. Did I hear you wrong, God? Did I get this wrong? Didn't you want me to come here? Did I, did I say something wrong? Maybe it was that Gentiles thing. If I just left that out, maybe they wouldn't have freaked out and tried to kill me. How could I, what did I, could I have done differently? Do you ever do that? Do you ever replay the tapes in your mind? How could this have gone differently? I imagine Paul doing that. Second guessing perhaps the words he chose. And if you think, well, Paul wouldn't do that. Paul wouldn't second guess. Paul was a man of confidence and conviction. He wouldn't be discouraged or second guess. Let's talk about another man of courage and confidence, John the Baptist. You've heard about him, right? Remember John the Baptist, when he is in prison, Herod has imprisoned him. Before he kills him, cuts off his head. Herod's in prison, and John's in prison, and he sends one of his disciples to Jesus to say what? Are you the one, or should we look for somebody else? Luke 7, Luke 7, verse 19, you can look that up. Because he's, he's second-guessing, right? Did I get this right? Did I have it right, God? Is this the one? Because it's not working out like I thought it would. I don't see the evidence of your kingdom like I hoped I would yet. I think Paul's having that feeling. God, I knew there'd be hardship, but I thought there'd be some results. I thought there'd be some movement of your spirit. I thought there'd be some repentance, some Jews coming to faith, something. And of course, God knows what was in Paul's heart and his mind, just like he knows exactly what's in ours. And the very first thing he offers Paul is what he offers us, and frankly, it's the very best thing he can give us, himself. The best thing God can give you at all times, especially when you're feeling a discouraged discouraged soul, is a sense of his presence, is the knowledge that he's with you. 
Now, I think, though it's the best thing he can give us, and he does give it to us, I think often it's the thing we le- are least likely to look for initially, right? We're focused on what? Our immediate circumstances, our problem. When it comes right down to it, what you and I most need from God is not for him to magically change things, not for him to get us out of whatever it is, not for him to fix the problem, but to be with us. Just to know we're not alone. Now, here's one of our problems, I think, and I do this as well. My, in my work as a pastor, I see this in people all the time, I'm talking with a couple people just this past week where this is the primary issue. We tend to evaluate whether or not we think God is with us based on what we think he is or is not doing for us. You understand? We tend to th- evaluate God is with me or he's not based on what we think he is or is not doing in our circumstances. So is God coming through for me? Oh, he's with me. Is life still hard? Where are you, God? Which of us hasn't done that? I thought you were going to be there for me, defined as fixing this problem. Notice, Jesus shows up. He says nothing about Paul's arrest. He doesn't say, don't worry, I got a plan to break you out of here, right? He just comes and stands by him. Things are hard, we think, well, God must not be with me. Jesus does not speak to Paul immediately, but he does say to him, after he's been with him, standing near him, the first thing he says is, take courage. Your translation might say, take heart. God does not say this ever in the scriptures, particularly the New Testament, without the accompanying promise of his presence. In Matthew 14, the disciples are in a boat. They're going across the, la- the Sea of Galilee. And I've been to that, sea, that lake. It's, a, it's like twice as big as Lake Geneva. It's not really a sea. But the wind and rain comes off Mount Hermon. You can see how it could become dangerous fast. And there, there a storm comes up and they fear for their lives. And Jesus comes walking on the water. And what does he say to them? Take courage. Take heart. But he says that as his presence comes to them, Right? He calms the wind and the waves. And then later on, he says to his disciples in Matthew 16, verse 33, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, take courage, for I have overcome the world. His presence in the midst of it. For the Christian, courage is the certainty that God is real and God is with you. Let me say that again. If you'd like to take notes, that's one worth jotting down. For Christians, courage is not the absence of fear, not, you know, just this, I I muster up the courage to do it on my own strength. Courage is the absolute certainty that God is near, real, and with you. That's what courage is. Life is still hard. Events are still scary. There's still pain. But it's it's the rock solid certainty that God is real and God is with me. That's what courage is. Now, the next thing Jesus says is a bit curious at first uh, when we read it. Uh, Verse 11 again. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so also you must testify in Rome. Huh? How is that encouraging? What is Jesus actually saying here? This is the encouragement of past faithfulness. Let me explain. Jesus is saying essentially... You did it, Paul. You did what I asked you to do. You completed the mission. You came to Jerusalem and you testified about me. Now, we would look at the text and I think Paul felt this and say, yeah, but not very successfully. Is that what you wanted, God? I mean, nothing really happened there. But that's not the point. Jesus does not praise Paul for his success. He doesn't say, look at all the converts you made. Why not? Because Paul doesn't make converts. Neither do you and neither do I. He doesn't say, look at at the difference you've made. All he says is, you obeyed me. You were faithful to me. Paul, I think, is looking at the circumstances and saying, you know, I could handle prison if lives are being transformed, but I don't see anything. God shows up and says, you obeyed me. That's what matters. You did what I asked you to do. That's what matters. There is something wonderfully liberating about this when you begin to understand it. And I don't always have it in my heart and mind. 
But Jesus does not praise Paul for his success. He simply affirms his faithfulness. And when we get this into our mind and heart, A, that God is real and with us. He's present with us. Not whether or not we feel him or think we see him, we know that it's true because he's told us so. And he's given us his son, the incarnation, Emmanuel, God with us. We know it's true, despite how we feel in the moment. And the second thing then, when we realize that all God asks us to do is be faithful. All God asks us to do is do what he's called us to do in his word. That's hard enough, but that's all, that's all requ that's required of us. We don't have to make anything else happen. We don't have to fix our children's problems. We don't have to convert anybody. We don't have to reconcile people together. God does those things. He just calls us to be faithful where we are. There's something freeing about that, I think. Paul had his share of success, no doubt. He'd seen miraculous things, God doing incredible things, the preaching and teaching of his word. And I want to be clear, it is not wrong. It's a very good thing for us to expect God to show up and expect him to do great things. But I think the point here is, what do we do when it appears that he hasn't? How do we respond when it doesn't look like much is happening? We trust the one who is ultimately responsible for results. And that's not us, right? This comes home to me almost every Sunday, every weekend, every time I preach. I have no power to change anyone's life. God's word and God's spirit does. He calls us, me, to be faithful. And the same thing is true for you in your relationships, in your family. The main question for me and for you it's not different, is this. Was I faithful to his word? And was I relying on him in doing what I believed he called me to do? If you could answer yes to that, that you could have the encouragement of his past faithfulness, God would say to you, I'm pleased because you did what I asked you to do. Leave the rest to me. I remember when I was first a youth pastor here, I came from Willow Creek Community Church 16 years ago, big church Huge ministry. Our youth ministry, the time that I was there, was about the size of our entire Sunday attendance here at this church today, 1,800 students on a week. It was huge. And I was part of a big staff. We did big productions. It was a lot of fun. I came here excited. I'm going to change things, right? So I planned a big event. Blew almost half the year's budget on this one big fall kickoff event. We had, we're going to grill out. We're going to do great games. We had a band. We had everything. And nobody came. It was me and four church kids. Standing in this rented park with all this expensive equipment and all like four billion hamburgers, you know. I was so bitter and frustrated. I went home at that I literally went home to Aaron that night. My kid, Noah and Hannah were little. Benjamin was not yet. And I said, I, I don't know if I, I think I made a mistake. Maybe I could do ministry at Willow with all the stuff around me, but I don't think I, I'm not. I was totally discouraged. And I had my moment, you know. I don't want to compare me, myself to Paul in a prison cell. But I had that moment of God saying, it's not about you. Be faithful. Be faithful to what I've called you to do. The second half of Paul's little statement here, he says, as you have preached in Jerusalem, meaning I told you to go, you went, you did it. Leave the rest to me. Then he says, you must also testify, testify about me in Rome. This is curious. It had long been Paul's desire to preach in Rome. Romans 1, verses 10 through 11, he talks about his longing to be with them, his deep desire to be with the church in Rome. Now, this is the, the Roman church, the Christians in Rome, was one of the few in the New Testament that Paul did not plant or had not yet visited. Probably, most likely, Jews who were in town for Pentecost way back in Acts 2 hear the wonders of God proclaimed, get their hearts transformed, go back to Rome and start a house church teaching about Jesus. And Paul longs to be with them. Also, Paul says in multiple places that it's his desire to take the gospel to the far reaches of the empire where it's not yet been preached. He refers to Spain because Spain was about as far as the empire went in those days. I think Paul is thinking, looking at Rome to encourage the church and to set up a new base of operations, right? Jerusalem, Antioch in the north, and now Rome. The new center to spread the gospel. Paul says as much. In Romans chapter 15. And Jesus says, essentially, it's going to happen. In fact, in the text, he says, you must do these things. This, is, by the way, is the encouragement of future opportunity. The encouragement of future opportunity. Jesus says, you must testify about, testify about me also in Rome. Excuse me. The phrase testify, or must testify. 
The word must in Greek means it is necessary. It has to happen. Uh, Luke uses that 22 times in the book of Acts. It must happen. It's necessary. God is saying, Jesus is saying to Paul, Paul, it's going to happen. You're going to get there finally. Now, Jesus in his mercy leaves out the fact that he's going to go there as a prisoner and he's going to die there. But Paul doesn't need to know that just yet. What he says to him is, you're faithful to me to get in Jerusalem and I'm not done with you yet. Do you hear that? What encouragement that must have been to Paul. I'm not done with you yet. I still have plans for you. I can imagine Paul thinking, well, maybe my usefulness has been, it's, my time's up. Maybe the run's over here. I did all these great things and maybe it's somebody else's turn and I'm kind of done here. And Jesus shows up, gives him his presence, says, you've been faithful to me in the past. I'm not finished with you. You're going to go to Rome. You're going to proclaim my name there. The encouragement of future opportunity. I don't know about you, but I want to know that God's not finished with me despite my discouragements and my failures and my struggles. You want to know that? I hear God say to you, I'm with you. Think about this. Don't you long to hear God say to you, I'm with you. And I know things haven't turned out like you expected so far. But stay faithful to me because I'm not finished with you yet. I want to hear God say to you, I'm with you. And I know that when you look out at your life, you wonder what, what's going on. But stay faithful because I'm not done yet. I think that's what's happening here for the Apostle Paul. G. Campbell Morgan, a famous Scottish Presbyterian minister of the previous generation, writes about this very sermon, this very text. He says, all our fear, panic, and discouragement are ultimately the result of a dimmed vision of the Lord, a dimmed consciousness of Christ. I think he's exactly right. If you, tr if you peel back enough layers in your discouragement, in your fear, in your anxiety, you get down to the fact that perhaps... We, you are not really at the soul level convinced that God is real and God is near and God is faithful and he's not done with you yet. How do you know that? He's told you so in his word. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it and to carry it on the day of Christ Jesus. Friends, I don't presume to, uh, that all of you are discouraged here today. But I would go so far as to say that all of us have and at some point will feel that way. And when we do, I want to remind you again, you need to hear God say to you from his word, I'm with you. Stay faithful because I'm not done with you yet. We know that through Jesus Christ. We stand for closing prayer. And as we say, we say this every week, but if you're here and you'd like someone to pray with you, and to encourage you through prayer, come forward to the close of the service. We'd love to meet with you down front after the service. Let's bow together. Father, we acknowledge your faithfulness and goodness to us, even though sometimes we look at our circumstances and wonder where you are. Forgive us for our short-sightedness and give us more faith. Because, God, for those of us who are discouraged and those of us who are encouraged, we all want to hear you say that you're with us and that you have not given up on us. And we praise you for that, and we trust you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.